Hello, everybody. Can you hear me OK? OK, great. Um, I love when Matt asked me to come participate in USA Swimming events. As he mentioned, I was an age group swimmer. I had the chance to swim at a Division I school, a pretty mediocre Division I school, I have to say. But it was one of the dreams I got to fulfill. The dream that I didn't get to fulfill was winning an Olympic gold medal, which every swimmer wants to do. So all these years later, I feel very fortunate that I get to work here and um, spend time with these athletes. So what we're going to talk about today, as Matt mentioned, the mom is really a, a huge driver in making those family decisions. So we're going to talk to you about how at the US Olympic Committee, we try to partner those um, advertising opportunities together, sponsor opportunities together, um, put the moms and the teens and try to market to them together. So we'll start <clears throat> with a little bit of research. Uh, today, 36 million US moms in the country with children under 18, and 44% of those moms are millennial. When you look at the group, uh, the millennial group, which is the 18 to 34-year-old age group, you actually have 85% of new moms are millennials. So that's a really important age group. Uh, we're going to talk about them in a few minutes. There's some interesting trends happening within that millennial mom age group. Um, interesting, uh, something that we think about a little bit, this group, this, this mom group, has $2.1 trillion in spending power. And when you break it down even further to bicultural moms of Hispanic descent, you get into 57% of the spending power coming out of this, this really quickly gr uh, growing group. So uh, an important group to think about. But we're going to talk about Team USA moms and fans. And in order to do that, I selected a picture of the most, uh, the most famous swim mom of all time, after Joanne Pasquale. Uh, you, guys recognize, <laughs> you guys recognize Debbie Phelps. Before we move away, I have to point out two things that I love about this picture. Um, Michael's niece covering her ears from the screaming, and, and the guy behind Debbie wearing the drinking team t-shirt. <laughs> I was like, I, I know what you mean. I feel it. <laughs> so a couple years ago at the US Olympic Committee, um, we decided we wanted to understand our fans better. And we conducted extensive research to try to understand what does an, uh, what does an avid fan of the Olympic movement look like? Most people who you ask, do you like the Olympics, will say yes, and they have some sort of connection to it. But we really wanted to look at those avid fans. And we gave them a nickname. We called them Fangelists part fan, part evangelist of our nonprofit mission. And we broke them up into three groups. Uh, the one I want to talk to you about is the values-driven group, because that seemed to associate best with our moms group, 35 to 49. And we'll talk a little bit about what drives their, their interest in the movement. Uh, in the meantime, we also saw that there was a segment, a sports enthusiast segment, which is really more of active athletes who want to learn more about what the other athletes are doing so they can apply it to their own sport. And then you've got the flag bearers, who are a more patriotic group who just love everything America, and so they love the Olympic team. But it's those value-driven uh, values driven group we're going to talk about. So uh, oop, I went backwards. <laughs> the values-driven group self-identifies with statements like these if you're looking at the red bar. I'm happiest when I'm with my family. I care a great deal about the environment. World events are very important to me. I'm deeply spiritual. I travel for pleasure. So as we looked at the large groups of fans who really advocate for our movement, what we found was that this values-driven group, the mom group, was the most holistic in the way that they view the world. Uh, mind, body, spirit, they were all important qualities to this group of people. And they look for connections on, on, in a way that's holistic. So what, what really drives their interest in the, in the Olympics? Um, we did a deep dive into this and presented statements that would try to get to the heart of what they loved best about the Olympic movements. And, and we pre presented that in a lot of different ways. And what we found was that team moms are really driven. Their interest is, is motivated by national pride, by sportsmanship, by belief in the Olympic values, to be inspired. They're looking for stories that will inspire their kids and their families. They love the color and the pageantry of the event. They love Cinderella stories, particularly in the Hispanic audience. Uh, one thing that's important about this group is that they are really tuned in during the Olympics. So they're consuming over four hours a day of content, and they're on multimedia screens. They're usually using a second or a third screen, mostly to get background on the athletes, um, which we think is really great. It differentiates us from other sports, like the NFL and MLB. <clears throat> in the Olympic movement, there's really a much deeper interest in where did that athlete come from? Uh, what did they overcome? What's their story? What's their background? Where are their parents from? Where do they go to school? Can I make that athlete relatable to my own kid? I heard <clears throat> Chuck talking earlier about um, 
When you're pitching to local media, try to find a really interesting background story. And Chuck mentioned, does <clears throat> the parent have an interesting job, or did the kid overcome something that other kids are struggling with and could serve as an inspirational story? We do that a lot on our content teams at the digital media department. We're constantly looking for really impressive stories of achievement and overcoming obstacles, because it helps people make those stories relatable. Um, and then the highest sponsor empathy. So this group really understands that the sponsors are critical for supporting the Olympic and Paralympic dreams. Uh, they're good advocates for your message if you have sponsors of your programs and your clubs and your teams to get that message out there for you and, and try to drive purchase consideration and loyalty. This group has the highest purchase consideration, the highest loyalty of all of our groups. <clears throat> OK, so how do we target this mom group? Well, we try to combine them with the teens. So we try to target them together. Uh, I won't make you read the whole slide, but what we did was we segmented our fans into different groups, generational segments, teens, 12 to 17, millennials, 18 to 34, Gen X, 35 to 49, and then <clears throat> generously called Boomers Plus, which is 50 and up, which really covers a very wide span, as you guys know. But I think the important thing to notice here um, we look at their interest, we look at the channel on which they're engaged, we look at their favorite sports, and that's how we gather the insights. So anybody who's got little girls or you spend some time, this probably looks like Matt, this could be Matt's two daughters in the upper right corner. <laughs> you know, they just want to dress like Gabby Douglas and they want to look like Olympians and then they have these fake medals on. You know, anybody who sees these little girls knows that they really want to connect, they want to have that dream, they want to feel like that's them and that's their future. The, the areas of engagement are really social media to reach this teen group. Anybody who has little girls, you know, they're constantly going like this. I don't know how they don't get thumb cramps, but they're constantly going like this on Instagram and Snapchat looking at their phones, and they'll like anything that their friends put up. It doesn't have to be a good picture. It's like an affirmation that we're friends. Yes, I'll like your Instagram picture. That means we're friends. So <clears throat> the one really interesting thing about this group, which actually surprised me to some extent, was the fact that the teen group over-indexes on sponsor involvement, meaning if a sponsor offers a giveaway or a promotion or contest, uh, a content sharing, this group over-indexes on likelihood to participate. So that's an important note for us at the US Olympic Committee, because we'll partner it later in a few minutes when we talk about the Gen X mom group. OK, and these are millennials. <clears throat> Remember, they're 44% of the moms in this country and 85% of new moms. So within five or six or seven years, you're going to see these kids in some of your Make a Splash programs and some of your Learn to Swim programs. <clears throat> these moms are uh, the interest, social causes. They're connecting with the athletes and the Cinderella stories. Females engage on social media for causes. Uh, one thing that we've been doing lately is trying to use marketing technology to learn a little bit more about what people are saying. And when it comes to millennials, we like to say, they talk, we listen. So we've just recently employed some marketing technology that allows us to really scan the internet for uses of our brand, of the words Team USA, US Olympic Team, US Olympic Committee. Not just social media, but mainstream media sites, news, forums. And what we found is that whenever there's a cause to gather around, it seems like the females get engaged, they start talking, they take the time to tweet to Facebook to comment on a story written by one of the major news media sites, uh, more so than the men. The men will respond if there's a great victory victory or something happens, Team USA wins something. So you see a little bit of a shift. The gender spectrum goes male for the victories and female for the causes. So that's an important part of this uh, millennials group. You'll see that the social media, uh, social media channels have changed. Um, if we went back, we look at those teens who are on Instagram, Snapchat, YouTube. Those kids are constantly streaming videos on YouTube. Remember like when you liked a song when you were our age, you would go buy the record? Now they just watch it on YouTube. I don't know how anyone makes any money. But um, <laughs> you look at the engagement of this group, 18 to 34, and they're more about Facebook for sharing, and they're more about Twitter for news. Uh, Pinterest is interesting to us. We've done a little bit of research here, and we're finding that the millennial group sort of splits two ways. They'll use Pinterest for their own personal utility. I like that dress. I want to remember that eyeshadow. I want to remember this healthy recipe or uh, a gym locally that I want to go to. Or they'll use that utility for the kids, how to make cupcakes for school, what to do on a rainy day, what to do when your kids are going crazy and it's snowing out, uh, how to keep, help a kid go to sleep. So you've got like a really interesting split on Pinterest between self-interest and family kid interest. OK, then we get into the Gen X. And then this is the 35, 49 age group. This is really where we look for those moms. They're such a prevalent group. 
Um, some of their interests, exercise fanatic, they're all about family. Parents are attending children's activities and sporting events. So we didn't see a lot of self-serving in this group. We see a lot of family activities, disposable income, time, travel, their money. It's all going to supporting their kids in their sports and their activities. So that's an important connection point for us. We're a fundraising organization. We need to raise money. We need to sell retail. We need to sell sponsorships. And it's really important to realize at this stage in their lives, the parents are really more focused on the sport that their child's involved in, like USA Swimming, USA Hockey, USA Figure Skating. So it's hard to go after that group to support the US Olympic team in general when really they're devoted. A lot of their disposable income is going to support their sport. As you know, it can be really expensive, especially travel. So um, again, this group has similar social media to the millennials, uh, Pinterest, um, Facebook, Twitter, news, trying to target information that they want to go back to later on, um, on Pinterest. This is a busy group, and Pinterest becomes a really easy thing to like put a notepad. You know, it's almost like you used to take notes and stickies and leave them all over your office. Uh, one other thing about this group I want to point out is that they over-index as high on sponsor-involved as the teens do. So remember, the teens are an over-index on sponsor-involved, and the parents are an over-index on sponsor-involved. So in order to participate in these contests, the teens require the parental approval. So you can really target them together. When we ask them, well, what do you want in a sponsor activation? What's important to you? I, I had a hard time believing all these people just want coupons. But what they're looking for is an opportunity to win a trip to the games, an opportunity to have a behind the scenes experience, an opportunity to meet an athlete and get an autograph signing. So as we put our minds together and try to look at this full picture, which I encourage you to do, I'm sure you're doing it already, if you have an Olympian in your program, if you've got um, anybody who could, could really kind of drive some cachet, maybe you could auction off a meet and greet, get them to participate in your um, fundraising, in your local uh, solicitation, trying to get new swimmers to come out, take advantage of those, of those Olympians if you have the opportunity. OK, so we looked at all of them together. I didn't go into the boomers. That's for another presentation uh, when Matt asked me to present on boomers. <laughs> but um, what we did, this is how we work. We, we try to make things make sense in curvy line graphs. So what we did was we measured um, engagement. We said that our fans are really important to us in a couple different ways. Through uh, driving revenue, because we are a nonprofit, we do not receive government funding. We're completely dependent on donors and sponsors to, to fund the Olympic and Paralympic teams. So we, met, we measured engagement in the blue line. Let me see if I get this right. Oh, oh, I did it wrong. He told me not to do that, and I did it wrong. Jonathan, I'm sorry, what do I do? Oh, there we go. Yeah, clearly I'm a digital media director. Um, OK, I'm just going to point with my arm. I'm just going to point. <laughs> so the blue line is engagement. And we started saying, well, what's engagement? How do you measure it? The green line is revenue. And that was really clear. Uh, teens, they have no money. Uh, millennials are starting to have, um, they're starting to have a little bit money, their first job, or maybe they're in college, parents are paying expenses, but they work at the local deli and they've got a little extra money, and they're socially active, they're becoming socially aware. Um, their friends are supporting causes on social media, like the ALS Bucket Challenge, and all of a sudden you get these 18 to 34 year olds who are actually starting to become socially aware and want to be supportive and kind of want to jump on the, the cause bandwagon, which is terrific. So we see a little bit of bump there. Again, the Gen X, we think think that, that the disposable income is really devoted to the kids and their activities and, and the amount of time that that consumes. But then you get into boomers who are a really patriotic, supportive group. They love history. Um, we could send out newsletters about Mary Lou Retton and Tracy Calkins and Michael Jordan, and that kind of gets that group going when the teens don't even know those names. Uh, but the engagement was really important to us. So what we found was that the millennials will be more frequently engaged. When you look at a boomer who might make a donation, maybe the boomer does that once a year. Maybe they purchase a nice sweater with a brand on it because they like recognition. But they're not going to do that frequently. Meanwhile, the millennials will follow the athletes after the games. So following the 2012 Olympics, I used to joke and say that our website had become the Ryan Lochte, Missy Franklin, Gabby Douglas website. <laughs> And I'm like, we cannot have the three of them on the front page every single day for six weeks. You know, we got to diversify, people. But at the same time, this group will watch the Olympics, learn a new name, and then follow them for the longest period of time after the Olympics. 
So again, this group is interested in the stories, interested in those people, and they'll actually take the time to follow them and see what they're doing. Are they on Dancing with the Stars? Are they on a red carpet? Did they just win an ESPY? Are they making a show called What Would Ryan Lochte Do? It's all very interesting to this group. We ask ourselves that a lot at the US Olympic Committee. What would Ryan Lochte do? So, OK, what else did I? OK, all right, so let's talk a little bit more about that millennial moms group, because they are growing so quickly, and they're such an important part, and an important part of your future, too, as those kids get a little bit bigger and you make those decisions about what sport to go into. So um, we've, got, we've got a lot of really great sponsors and partners that also share some of their thought equity with us about what they're studying in the different segments. And one of our consumer packaged goods, CPG sponsor, has done intensive research on moms at every age and at every level. And one of the things they're noticing about the millennial moms is a shift in mindset. <clears throat> so how many of you heard about the Giselle Bundchen quote? <laughs> Tom Brady's wife, can't say her name. Uh, she had a quote recently that was, um, I need to fill my own cup first before everyone can drink from it. And she was saying it's like on the plane when you put on your own mask before you put on everybody else's mask. And this spurred a polarizing debate because people were saying, well, you're putting yourself first before your kids. And of course, there were generations of moms who really self-sacrificed and, and, and put their, their family first. But what the sponsor is finding is that that's, it's not that they're putting themselves first. What they're trying to do is have a holistic approach to the way that they parent and to the way that they live. So they're being more, they're being more mindful in this trend of how's my health, how's my nutrition, <clears throat> how's my beauty, how are my interests, how is my career going, uh, education, they want to continue education. So this is a group of, I would call them multitasking women who are trying to make it all work. OK, and while they're most fulfilled by family, they're still trying to make all those things happen at the same time. So just kind of out of curiosity, we started <clears throat> thinking about this and thinking, where did that come from? What's the, <clears throat> what's the background of the millennials that, that would really drive that tendency to a mind shift, more so in this group than other groups before them? And when you look at the childhood, this is a group that grew up, every kid gets a trophy, everybody is recognized as special and unique. <clears throat> it's wonderful, you know, and an end to bullying. Bullying is becoming very unpopular, and it really wasn't talked about when I was a child. You just suffered it, you know, and you had to endure it. Um, so this is really a great group that's saying you're special, you're unique, you can have your dreams, you could, you could, you know, empower yourself. And then Title IX, this is a generation that grew up with Title IX. I, I was a benefactor of Title IX. You're empowered. You have time management skills. You can juggle multiple commitments. When you're a, a Division I, Division II, Division III athlete, as you guys know, you're really, you're really juggling a lot, and you feel very confident. So that's, that's one of the things that makes this group different. <clears throat> They're highly networked. They have a, a large network, a lot of communal resources that help them make everything work, from carpooling to uh, drop-off dry cleaning. There are all kinds of easy resources these days, if you want to throw money at the problem, to make life a little bit easier for these moms. <clears throat> resources, uh, uh, Google, information. This group grew up with Google, information at their fingertips. Because of that, they can be a little bit more skeptical. You know, you don't necessarily rely on traditional, uh, traditional advertising the way you did before. You rely more on the recommendations of your friends and, um, and peers and other people like you who are choosing products and deciding where they're going to uh, devote their loyalty. So we think a lot about this group. I think it's an important group. Um, so how can you think about this group? I was, I was thinking about you guys, and I mean, literally, I spent so many weekends at the pool, and it's such a big part of my childhood, my history, my family. Um, and I was thinking about how you can apply this changing shift if you're, in, if you're sensing it among your own uh, athlete populations, among the mom populations. You know, I was thinking, what could you do? And I heard Chuck talk this morning about applying Wi-Fi. Can you offer moms free, or can you offer Wi-Fi? Can you offer free Wi-Fi? Wouldn't that be great? Uh, is there a little area? I know this is a lot to ask for when you're trying to organize a big swim meet invitational, uh, but is there a little area where you could set up some chairs and some desktop, and in between those two events, which are 90 minutes apart, the moms can be catching up on work and feel like they're making the most of their time at the pool, so they don't feel like they're just killing six or eight hours at the pool. Uh, are there jungle gyms? Um, my mom loves to tell me how my brother had to sit in a hotel in Pennsylvania one Easter because I was at Zones. And I was like, well, I'm just sorry about that, but you know, I had to go to football games. So like, is there a way that you could entertain the other siblings and make it easier for the moms who can't leave the kid at home um, but
but the kid's too young to actually be swimming at that meet or in your program. Uh, facilities, wouldn't it be amazing? Like we had swim meets at such great locations, universities and gyms, Fordham University. I was a, a swimmer on Long Island, Hofstra University. Wouldn't it be great if when you work with that local organizing committee, you could ne negotiate a one-day rate maybe for the local gym, the facility, the mom, the dad, in between the, the events or in between their shifts timing. Uh, they could go work out for an hour. And again, just feel like they're taking care of their body. They're taking care of their mental health. They're not wasting time. They're making the most of the day. And then nutritional. My memory of my swim meets in the Northeast were that all of the food tables were bagels and Dunkin' Donuts, right? Anybody from the Northeast? I loved it. Totally loved it. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that, but um, if you do get a segment who's going to be there for eight or nine hours and start to feel crappy from eating that kind of stuff all day, like maybe you could squeeze it into your club budget, but still make your budget profitable at the sales table. I know that you guys have to make money off of what you're selling.